In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, we are continuing with our series that we started a couple months ago about godly wisdom, basically taking the uh, in details every attribute of uh, a godly wisdom, because we all want to acquire godly wisdom from James 13, I'm sorry, ver uh, James 3, verse 17, and we are now in the fifth attribute, which is that godly wisdom is willing to yield. Last time we did a little bit of um, definitions uh, and kind of clarification because that word willing to yield is there in the Bible only one time. There's a lot of words that mean yield in the Bible, but it's not this one, okay? This is that Greek word eupithes, and in Arabic it's kind of tough to say, it's mudaina. You can't find that anywhere else in the Bible, um, which I don't mind, it's hard to say. Um, and we talked about that word that first of all, it's not God doesn't want us to always yield, but to always be willing to yield, to always be willing to consider to yield. Um, and then after that, we talked about a little bit of clarification between willing to yield and boundaries, lest anybody might think uh, um, that these two things are contradictory or don't work with each other. As a matter of fact, that in order for me to truly learn the art of being willing to yield all the time, I need to establish good, healthy, clear boundaries. And then I'm able to be willing to yield, not out of force or, or obligation or, or fear or, what, or lack of boundaries, but actually out of my own volition, out of my own will. And then we talked about a few examples from the Bible of, they don't say the word yield, but it's, it is an example of being willing to yield and yielding. The first one was the closest relative to Ruth from Ruth 4.6, who was willing to yield his right of redemption for Ruth because she, her husband died and left her childless. So per the law of Moses, he needs to, the next of kin, the closest relative, is supposed to marry her to bear children for this, uh, for, for the name of the departed person. And he was willing to yield his right of redemption to Boaz. We're not going to talk about the reasons because he kind of did it for a little bit of selfish reasons, but he was willing to yield. That was an example. Another one is in 1 Corinthians 7, 4, which talks to the husbands and the wives that both the husband and the wife are supposed to yield authority over their bodies to their spouses. Daniel 3.28 was uh, the story of the three youth who were willing to yield their life rather than worship anything or anyone other than God. They were willing to give that. They have a right to their life, right? God gave them their life, but they were willing to yield it for the sake of not worshiping anything or anyone other than God. Um, another one was what we pray in the Gregorian liturgy, that we are willing to yield our the symbol of our free will. It's not our free will, okay? It's the symbol of our free will because that's what God gave us, which actually we're yielding it back to Him because He already yielded it to us because He owns our will. But he said, no, I want you to have free will. I'm going to yield my right to your will to you. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And then lastly, there's many other examples. But in Philippians 2 and in Galatians 5, these are verses that exhort us, actually commend us to be willing to yield. That we are to yield ourselves to each other, to serve one another, to esteem others as more important than me, than to, to love my neighbor, and so on. Today we're going to continue with willing to yield part two. Because after all these examples and exhortations, I do want to clarify that there are times when we should not yield. Okay? Um, sometimes I come across Christians who are willing to put themselves in quite vulnerable positions or dangerous positions or really unwise positions because they think that this is what Christianity is and this is what Christianity does. Okay, so the first example of um, not willing to yield actually has to do with this. This is in Acts, um, later on in Acts, while St. Paul was in prison, his sister's son, his nephew, heard that some Jews made a vow and they wanted to kill him. Okay, and so he had his uh, nephew, he told him to go to the centurion and tell him what he found and, and, and here's here's... This is an example of not, not yielding, okay? Here's what he told his nephew to tell the centurion. And he said, the nephew, he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the council, as though they were going to inquire somewhat more thoroughly about him. So, do not listen to them. That's an example of not yielding, okay? Don't just do it. For more than 40 of them are in hiding to ambush him. 
and these men have put themselves under an oath to not eat or drink until they kill him, and now they are ready and waiting for assurance from you. You do not need to yield to harm. I feel silly saying it, but you do not need to be willing to yield to harm. It is not right for you. Please don't ever think that it is okay to yield your, to your, um, say I'll say spouse, to physically harm you uh, and to think that this is willing to yield or that this pleases God in any way. God does not rejoice in iniquity. You do not need to yield to harm. Um, you do not need to yield to harm unless, can you tell what? There is a difference. There's one condition where it's okay. Kind of like the three youth. You do not need to yield to harm unless it is for the sake of the glory of God and the expansion of his kingdom. Somebody beating a spouse or her spouse is, is not going to help anything about the kingdom of God. You don't need to yield to that one. Okay? So this is an example of when not to yield. Another example is... Uh, in Romans, uh, actually, St. Paul exhorts us, he said, Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your member as members as instrument of righteousness to God. Okay? You should never yield to any invitation or the similitude to, uh, to sin or the similitude of sin. Okay? Um, Eve yielded to having a conversation with the serpent, maybe out of ignorance. I mean, she was very naive, right? She was childlike, she, so she didn't know. Um, but then again, she yielded, therefore, because she had the conversation, she yielded to the temptation to eat from the tree. I want to clarify something. Temptation in of itself is not a sin. Even our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted on the Mount of Temptation, right? Temptation is not a sin or an indication of a sin. It is yielding to the temptation. Temptation is simply an invitation to sin. And if I, if I yield to it, then I'm sinning. We should never yield to that invitation. Hebrews 12, 4 says, You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. I mean, resisted to the point of shedding blood. This is like the opposite end of the extreme of being willing to yield. Okay? No way I'm going to yield to this. Um... Joseph, the righteous, did not yield to the invitation to sin by Porphyra's wife. Um, by contrast, King David uh, was yielded to the temptation to stay home when it was time of battles, when the king should go to battle. Yielded to the temptation to keep looking at Bathsheba. Let's say the first time he saw her by accident, although that was no accident. It wouldn't have happened if he had done what he was supposed to, to start out with. Okay? And then he yielded to the temptation to do all the other stuff. I want to say something that I want you to, to really remember. Sin always, always, always does three things. Sin always takes you farther than you want to go. Sin always costs you more than you want to pay. And sin always promises more than it delivers. Okay? So we should never yield to the invitation to sin. The last one I wanted to share about um, not yielding uh, is actually from the book of Nehemiah. So just a quick background, Nehemiah was, got permission from the king. He was the chief cupbearer and he got permission from the king and supplies and everything and people and all that to go back to Jerusalem after the destruction and to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. Okay? And he was met with all kinds of resistance from outside, from inside. From, it was a, it's a, it's a, one of my favorite books from the Old Testament. Okay? And then look at this part here. There was these guys that were just like a thorn in his side and they were like an annoying fly that wouldn't go away, okay? Um, Nehemiah 6, 2 to 4, it says, Then Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So right away, they thought to do me harm. It's not for the glory of God. Therefore, I should not yield, okay? But actually, this is not the main point of this one. Here's how it comes. So I sent messengers to them. They were working day and night, and they were working with one hand and holding the sword in the other. So they were like incredibly busy, and they were doing pretty much the most important things in their life at the time, which is to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. It has a lot of beautiful metaphors in our lives. Look at what he told them. 
I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? And then it continues on in verse 4. But they sent me the same message or this message four times. They wouldn't quit. The enemy will never quit. And I answered them with the same matter or in the same manner. So you should never yield to anyone or anything that distracts you from your spiritual feeding, from your own salvation, and from the work for the glory of God or the kingdom of God. We should never yield to this. Okay? Um, our Lord Jesus Christ said you cannot yield to two masters. He didn't say that word yield, but he said you just can't give in or be willing to comply with or surrender your rights to, remember all the definitions we talked about last time, to two masters. It's, it's going to be one or the other. You can't do both. And, and a lot of us are trying to do both, and it's not going to happen. Okay, real quick, um, I wanted to talk about a few points of like, okay, why should we be willing to yield? What are the benefits of being willing to yield? There's so many, it is like, okay, all of us after we hear this, we'll be like, okay, I have to, to always be yani, focused on this and try to do it. First of all, it significantly reduces misunderstandings. 99% of the fights and the strifes and the arguments and the catastrophes that result from them that sometimes last for decades are a result of people not willing to yield willing to yield it's not because of not yielding just willing to yield just willing to listen to consider to see what the other side is to see where they're coming from so it significantly reduces misunderstandings and fights and struggles and arguments and so on number two it communicates trust and acceptance and value i'll, I'll define it this way when i'm not willing to even willing to yield to a person i'm communicating to them that i don't care about them I don't trust in what they have to say. I won't, I'm not going to even listen to what you have to offer. I'm not even willing to yield. This is the message that I'm offering. So when I'm, when I'm willing to yield to a person without saying anything, without doing anything, this communicates to the other person that I accept you. I think you have something good to offer. Maybe I won't agree with it. Maybe I will not yield. But at the very least, I am willing to yield. I am willing to consider what you have to say because I value you as a person in your ideas and thoughts and stuff. Number three, it increases the oneness. The oneness. Kind of like the um, the disciples and all the new believers in the book of Acts. It's lovely how it talks so much about in one accord, in one accord, in one accord. Whenever something would happen, they would always listen to each other. Beautiful example of this was the, um, the first council in Jerusalem, how they got together, they discussed, and then they came out with a conclusion. They said, here's what you should do, you know, uh, abstain from uh, immorality and don't eat blood and so on. Or like when they, when they had an issue of like, okay, we can't be busy serving tables. We have a bigger job to do. I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Remember that one? Not willing to yield. That's from Nehemiah. So they sit together. What shall we do? What do you think? What do you think? Okay, let's think about this. I like this. No, I don't like this. Okay, let's do that. We'll pick seven deacons and so on. This is, it, it increases the oneness. It makes, number four, it makes us, the body of believers, much, much stronger. It makes for a healthy church with deep roots and lots of fruit. Simply when we are willing to yield to each other. Um, because we are sensitive to one another. We consider one another. We are willing to yield to one another like members of one body. Like, yeah, like in an actual body, when a member of the body needs something, wants to say something, wants to be heard, you know. The body listens to it, right? And then everybody cooperates. The brain decides stuff, the nerves send signals, the blood rushes to certain areas, the glands secrete things that are needed, like the hands and the feet. Everybody is yielding to another. Automatically, naturally, because God made us this way. So it needs for, for a healthy, strong, fruit-bearing tree. I'll mention a couple more and then we'll stop here. It promotes peace. If we cooperate, if we communicate to other to each other, I value what you have to offer and I'm willing to consider it and to listen to. If we work together and come up with a solution, then and we are a stronger church, obviously it, we will all have peace. Peace in the church, peace in our home, peace in our work, by simply willing to yield. <clears throat> Number six, it increases the ways of growth and improvement exponentially. 
there's a point in everyone's life when they realize, I don't know everything. And it doesn't happen till we're a little bit older. Some of us older than others. There's a point when I come to the point where like, why did I do that, man? Their idea was so much better. And, and it's kind of a, eating a piece of humble pie and it's kind of bitter and it doesn't taste good, but it's lovely because then hopefully, if I'm not stubborn, this will promote me to come to the point where I begin to listen to other people. And if I'm simply willing to go, wow, that's a good idea. You know, and, and like we come up with new ideas and brainstorming and you know how they say new blood? or like new employees or new servants or new whatever, they come up with new things that there, there is the dangers of like, here's what we've been doing, here's how we're gonna do it, this will never change, and I'm not even willing to listen to the new ideas to try something new or something different. It kind of stuns the service, the service or, or the improvement or the growth. Number seven, it helps us better understand each other. If I don't hear you, how will I know you? If I don't listen to what you have to offer, I may not agree with it, but just to have the willingness to look inside you. You know that story, I don't remember it, about, uh, I think a muallim, you know, like a, a lead chanter who was uh, blind, they're typically blind in Egypt, and, and somebody came to the church and the muallim, the blind, or I don't know the details, Mishmah, it doesn't matter, but the blind uh, a deacon uh, uh, told this person who was new, he said, Come here, talk to me so that I may see you. He's blind, but like, like I want to look inside you. It's kind of like I see the painting of an artist. It's like an invitation to go inside this person and see how they think and, and all that stuff. And you know what? There's no way you're going to love somebody you don't know. So the Lord told us this. How are you going to love God whom you haven't seen when you can't love the ones you have seen? Okay, so, so we need to, this helps us, willing to yield helps us understand each other and see where the other person is coming from. Help us see what are their wounds, what are their weaknesses, what is their baggage, what are their gifts and talents and so on. And this is the other point here, number eight, that it helps us discover each other's talents. I am shocked sometimes when like somebody who's been in the church for a year or two or three and has this tremendous talent and like nobody knows. They didn't say they're not gonna walk in and say, by the way, I'm really good at this, y'all should check me out. No, but it's if we talk and communicate and listen, eventually we discover each other's talents simply because we're, we are willing to yield. I'm gonna stop here and God willing, next time we're gonna talk about just a couple more points or motivations for why we should yield. And then after that, we're gonna talk about the traps and the hindrances that get in our way and that hinder us from yielding. May God help us all to be people who live by godly wisdom that is always willing to yield. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.